This episode, I'm going to show you why your TPU prints are failing. We're going to look deeper into the physics involved and why it makes TPU such a pain to print, what you can do about it, and how to really understand what's going on between your extruder and your hot end. Let's go. Today's video is sponsored by PCBWay. More on that later on. TPU, the bendy, boingy, woingy filament that we've all come to hate and somehow we still want to print with it. How fickle it is with its stringing and its Houdini level escaping skills. How do we deal with it? So without further ado, oh, one slight ado actually, as I always say on these engineering-y sort of videos, I'm conflating units as usual. When I say pressure, I mean force. When I say force, I might mean weight. Who knows? Feel free to complain in the comments, but I'm still going to do it. And the other thing, a lot of this is going to be wrong. I'm not an engineer. Anyway, let's go ahead and insult physics just one more time. I've said this before, but I want to flesh it out and show you an experiment in a moment, but we need to talk about elastic potential energy. We'll start with this thing I made. I'm going to call it um, a scale with a Bowden tube going to it. It's not calibrated to give exact amounts, but you know what? It works perfectly well for demonstrative purposes. Hooking it up to an extruder means you can extrude directly onto the scale. Well, directly through a Bowden tube anyway, but what this lets us see is the kind of forces that we get with TPU, specifically on a Bowden system. With the aid of Steve here, who happens to be a Bowden base printer, we can load up 95A filament and turn on the scale. As you can see, as soon as the filament hits the scale, the reading starts to rise. Not much thought is given to the forces involved in TPU printing, but they're not small, are they? A couple of hundred grams is probably what I would assume is the normal force applied to the uh, nozzle from the filament at this end. What I wanted to show with this setup was what happens at the extremes, and this is the first point I want to make, why you should not be yelling when TPU escapes from your extruder. If I extrude a ton of filament, and this would simulate fast printing that's at the edge of overwhelming the extruder, we see here forces at around one kilogram at the nozzle, but interestingly it peaks around that mark and then it, it just won't go any higher. It's not a fault of the scale, that's working perfectly. What's happening here is the TPU is starting to slip in the extruder. If we leave it, it slips back down every time we extrude it, and once it starts slipping it seems to find a path to less friction, presumably. Well, definitely, because it's deforming the filament around the gears, and that's making it easier to slip. And this is why, in my opinion, you should not be in this situation in the first place while printing TPU. If you have enough force to be in this critical area of operation where you risk slipping um, in this manner, there's always a slight bit of slippage, but that's another thing entirely. This will mean under extrusion or worse, the extruder will chew enough of the filament on the gears that it just won't have any grip to do any movements, retraction or extrusion, even when the pressure in the nozzle equalizes to a point where it should. What does this mean in the real world? Well, it means slow down, but also controversially, and this is hugely controversial, and I know that people will disagree with this, but I think the extruder should be tuned to slip, not to grip. It should be acting as a clutch in the system. You ideally want it to slip without damaging the filament if it hits an undesirable level of force. And that means that if you had this kind of situation, it would be recoverable. So that thing that people say that you should dial up the tension to make TPU work properly? Don't. If I load in some 70A filament into Steve, we can see what happens and get some insight into exactly why you can't do this, why you can't really print filament this soft on a Bowden like this. You can't. It literally is impossible. And finally, I can give you an exact answer of why it's impossible. And honestly, this surprised me as much as anyone. We know from the previous experiment that the extruder is capable of forces in excess of one kilogram. I think it's a lot more than that at the actual extruder end. I'm not saying newtons. I want you to understand clearly what kind of um, forces I mean. And I think um, the average layman understands a kilogram. So complain in the comments if you want. I'm just, I told you I'm going to do this. Uh, we see in the case of this setup that the scale is only seeing a few grams. It's not broken. Uh, this is literally all we get at the end of the tube with this filament, and it is happy to slip back down again as soon as it gets chance. Now, it's pretty easy to see that in the case of a Bowden tube setup like this, five grams or so is, is not enough to be able to push out the filament through the nozzle. And that's why you can't print this filament. It's that simple. You you can't get enough force to the nozzle to push it out without it slipping or unloading from the extruder. Where does all that extra force from the extrusion go? That is an interesting question. I cut a window into the side of a PTFE tube and I watched it under a macro lens. 
What you're seeing here is the filament expanding into the tube. This is 95A filament, and this is presumably where it stores most of its elastic energy. Also, this is probably why Capricorn tubing with its smaller internal diameter might really be worth the money, in theory at least. Certainly worth considering. One thing this scale-based experiment really showed that I didn't plan for, but it makes total sense when you think about it, I'll show you. In this TPU 95A scenario, we are happily extruding away. The working pressure could be, say, whatever's on the screen now. And I know it's not pressure. A few hundred grams worth of readings there, and everything's going fine. The extruder is not exploding TPU. Nothing is slipping. It's just happily printing. But we need to do a travel move, and so before we travel, we retract. Let's retract five millimeters of filament, and it doesn't retract the filament. If you think about it, this is because you are letting some of the elastic potential energy out of the system. To actually retract, you're going to need to retract all of the stored energy first before the filament even needs to think about actually physically moving. And then, um, because it's flexible, obviously, it actually has the ability to start storing energy the other way until it suits itself and actually decides to move. So when you're pulling it as well, uh, you are also storing elastic energy. This is, by the way, why we use PTFE tube. The less static friction in the tube means this is minimized. But of course, it's still an absolutely ridiculous amount for TPU, apparently. In this uh, case, it takes another five millimeters just to get to zero extrusion force. So that's a retraction of 10 millimeters to remove a few hundred grams of whatever that is in newtons of force to just to just to undo that before you can even start retracting. And yes, this is why you get stringing on TPU. I know, retraction isn't retracting a lot of the time, but that's not all. This is also why you need longer retraction length settings. Speculatively, I also feel like I could make a case for retraction settings being dependent on higher working pressures. So that would also mean different retraction lengths for higher speeds. But luckily, I think that same moot point, as you'll see in a moment, this is actually really interesting. If you think about all the elasticity we just had to unwind just to get the filament to move in the first place, you start to naturally think about what needs to happen to make TPU flow again after a retraction. Obviously, to add it all back again, right, you have to de-retract the same amount. You have to get back to the same level of elastic energy in the, in the filament. You have to compress it the same amount. So detraction isn't just about poking filament out of the nozzle either. It has to recreate the same pressure level that we had before we retracted. So when you start printing from zero pressure, you will not get the correct flow until you reach some kind of equilibrium. Now this is really complicated stuff, but if you imagine you have a hole at the end of the nozzle where the filament is somewhat able to eject from under pressure, and you have pressure inside the nozzle, the pressure will increase as a result of the extruding force at the extruder end, but it's highly likely that the pressure won't decrease from the nozzle at the same rate. And so your extruded line will start out under extruded and then it will be okay. And then when you stop, you still have that pressure backed up and the filament still wants to come out. As to how much this is a case is going to depend on a lot of things, not least the speed that you're printing at. But this is going into the territory of linear advance, which is a term you may have heard of. So let's go there, linear advance, let's do it. Pressure advance and linear advance are the same thing. Honestly, they kind of are, or to be specific, they are solutions to the same problem. So to all intents and porpoises, they are the same thing. But what's the problem? Well, it's the one we just mentioned, I'll show you. Here is some dodgy G code I wrote in about half an hour that just makes some lines. I will get onto why I didn't use the Marlin version in a minute. The lines do something that a slicer won't typically do. They speed up or slow down in the middle of a line for no reason. Why? To show why we need linear or pressure advance in a creative but not entirely real world manner. The first line at the bottom, hang on, okay, UV light, brilliant. First line at the bottom is just a standard line, it doesn't vary in width. The second line gets faster in the middle. You see the change in speed causes a change in the width? It shouldn't, there's no maths in the G code to tell it to do that. Extrusion is calculated over the length of the line and not the speed. This line should be the same thickness for its full length, but it is not. Same again for the next one, but the middle bit is faster. Then two lines that do the opposite, they slow down in the middle, and what do you know, it's fatter. Again, it shouldn't be, so what's going on? 
Well, I'll show you the same thing on a direct drive that managed to extrude um, more filament because it's not slipping, but we'll talk about that in a moment too. While I show you this, I'll explain what's going on. You see, an extruder, or rather the extrusion system as a whole, is not a linear system, especially not with TPU, but not with any filament as it happens. You're pushing stuff in at one end, and that's causing stuff to come out the other. And honestly, with TPU, it is a miracle that you even get remotely what you ask for out of the other end in a reasonable time frame. It's probably not a bad analogy to imagine a very long train pulling away from a stop. If you think about how long it would take for the rear carriage to start moving, that's not a linear relationship between the speed of the front of the train and the distance the rear carriage moves, is it? No. And the same applies to extruding. Linear or pressure advance will deal with linear because the equations are a bit simpler. It approximates the filament as a spring of all things, and that is why there is a K value that um, you use to tune linear advance. The mystery K value is a spring constant. Hooke's law? F equals minus Kx? Coincidence? No, it is not a coincidence. This is exactly the principle that linear advance is based on. When you push or pull an elastic material, it obeys Hooke's law, assuming of course it obeys Hooke's law, and so you can model that extra amount of extrusion that you have to do to get the exact amount of movement that you want by subtracting the elastic component. If all this is too much, then we can use the easy explanation, which is you have to push harder than the amount you would need to, and you have to also push more material if the filament wasn't boingy. And how much harder and how much more material depends on how boingy the material is. Do you know what this is? It's a break to talk about our sponsor. This is a sample PCB way sent me for one of their PCBs. I happen to be old enough, everyone assumes I'm in my 20s and I'm not going to contradict that, but I'm old enough to remember when the best you could do for your making projects was homemade PCBs. And kids today have it so easy with services like PCB Way. You just make a PCB in your favourite program, upload it, and you get something as good as this just sent to you in quantities as low as five pieces or less, depending on the service. And how easy is that? It's very easy. Very, very easy. And PCB Way has all these colours too. You don't have to use that boring yellowy brown colour that we all used to use. And you can do multiple layer, which, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't terribly easy or possible with homemade PCBs. Yes, it's the future, except it's the present, because you can wander down right now to the link below in the description and sign up, and in a mere few clicks you could have your PCBs made for you without lifting a finger other than the one on your mouse button. Remember also that PCB Way can make stuff for you like nylon parts or CNC milled or sheet metal to name but a few. Go check them out in the link below. Thank you to PCB Way for helping make this video happen, and now back to it. No, it's not. This is what a speed change looks like on PLA, and if you notice what happens here, changing speed is kind of recoverable pretty quickly. TPU sort of does that if you use more normal parameters, but it is still quite evident, at least from these results, that it will be very hard to truly tune TPU to behave well for all speeds. And that's a learning outcome. Tune TPU for one narrow speed range and stick with it. Now, in terms of tuning linear advance, either I'm using the Marlin tutorial thingy that generates a print wrong, or it doesn't work well with TPU. I suspect it's the latter. If you want my advice, then just start with a value like 0.2 and print cubes between that and 0.8 and just pick the best one. You can clearly see which one is best. Remember, of course, to print this at your normal TPU speed. As we just mentioned, the K value will increase if the material is more flexible, so of course, once we know that, it makes perfect sense that a K value of 0.07 for PLA, which is the default on my Sovol here, is not suitable for TPU. That's why it needs about 0.4 to 0.6. So this video is about why TPU fails and how to fix it, and in this case it's not that evident what that has to do with linear advance. Fine, linear advance improves quality, it makes corners look nicer, but if we think about it, properly tuned linear advance is one really huge advantage against the incorrect pressure at the extruder especially at the end of a print move, and we'll get to why that's bad. But also remember that having the correct pressure at the end of a print move is key to tuning retraction. And yes, for the last time, can we stop telling people to not retract TPU? Seriously, why would you want to do that? Another thing that's obvious when you know it, a properly tuned linear or pressure advance value will mean that you can and should reduce your retraction length. Retraction is about removing the nozzle's urge to ooze while moving. And linear advance, of course, aims to balance that pressure at the end of the printed line, so it's all connected. 
Everything's connected. Okay, it's 2022. The market for 3D printers has changed hugely in the last year, and I will make a video on that later, but I feel like we need to have a talk about Bowden. If we wind back a year or so, I was making videos on how to manage TPU in a Bowden printer, and this is great, of course. It makes the seemingly impossible possible. But I hope that we've seen from the demonstrations in this video that a lot of the problems with printing TPU are compounded way too much by that extra foot or so of tube. Almost every new printer I get in for review now is some kind of direct drive or another. Even the last bastion of Bowden, the Elegoo Neptune range, is now coming with a pro version with direct drive. Here it is. Looks cool, doesn't it? There's a review coming up on that. So my advice is, and honestly this is hard because I know a lot of you still have Steve's or equivalent, but if you want to print TPU well, and you want to print TPU a lot, and you want to do it without frustration, and you want good quality, you have to ditch the Bowden. Honestly, it's probably not that bad though. I mean, a reel of 95A TPU costs £20, and a reel of 70A TPU will probably set you back about £40 pounds, and you'll waste a good amount of that tuning and failing potentially with a Bowden system. Around the cost of two reels, or maybe even less, and a couple of hours of work could be spent on something like this direct drive upgrade. It looks ugly, but this one works fine. I think Bowden has had its day generally, and for TPU, it is just an unnecessary pain that can be solved easily by using direct drive. Of course, if you're just an occasional TPU printer, it doesn't necessarily make sense if you already have a Bowden based system, but this year onwards, would you buy one? Mm, not convinced. And the same advice goes for those of you who are still on machines like the Enders, still, um, with the board that doesn't have linear advance. If you have a Steve, for example, I would advise having a look at Mariscock firmware, which has actually started enabling linear advance on a Steve. I know that a lot of people think that these boards don't have UART connected, I mean that is true, so they can't use linear advance, but that's not true. Surprise, this has absolutely nothing to do with UART. It's complicated, there are reasons, but linear advance on a Steve is now something I highly recommend looking at. It's a win-win anyway because it hugely improves the print corner quality and the stringing on PLA too. I think the main reason your TPU is failing is because you're treating it like PLA. And I don't just mean you're not slowing down. Slowing down just won't work. It's imperative when printing TPU that you understand and manage the pressure in the extrusion system as a whole. And the answer to what to do about problems printing TPU is to recognise what you're seeing and to know why it's doing what it's doing. Filament escaping the extruder is a perfect example of this. Sure, some extrusion systems are literally impossible in terms of achieving the right nozzle pressure for printing TPU, but in my experience, most extruders and systems are not, and the escaping filament, that is on you. So, I'm sorry to say there is no quick fix. If you feel like I clickbaited you with the title, then I'm sorry, but you have to become one with the TPU if you want to print it. Every video I make on TPU, I personally learn a ton of new things about it. Just sometimes the weirdest things. It is a huge and complicated topic. And I feel like the future is looking very good for TPU because some of the modern extruder hot end combinations that I've seen lately, like the Creality Sprite and the FL Sun extruder, they are outstandingly well engineered for dealing with the constraints of TPU. Anyway, that was yet another TPU video. Does your brain hurt? Mine does. Now go loosen your extruder screw a bit, tune your linear advance if you have it, and try and print something. I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. You need to understand nothing is ever faked on this channel. Never. Wouldn't, wouldn't dream of it.